Well, again, welcome back to the lecture series. Each week, we want to just remind you, this is a wonderful community program, a partnership that's been fostering for a couple of years, actually, between the LST 393 Veterans Museum, the USS Silversides Museum, and Muskegon Community College. So welcome, and thank you guys for being a part of this. We've got a great series of pre presenters tonight. We've got a little bit longer program. We're going to go to 8.30, so uh, be patient. We've got some wonderful people to hear from. Again, John Stevenson will entertain us tonight with stories from the air war in the Pacific. Mr. Don Goodman, a local author, a retired MCC professor, will be reading some of his work. I was very reluctant to have Peggy Henley Maniotis uh, present because she's been scheduled every single night we've canceled. <laughs> so if we get a foot and a half of snow tonight, it is her fault. And we are very well, glad to welcome back Mr. Nick Budimir, who will make up one of the missed presentations. We'll hear his great story about the war in the Balkans. So the air war, the air war in the Pacific. What we've got on this map up here is a red line that kind of shows the extent of Japanese control. Three million square miles, an incredible space controlled by the Japanese. And then we see allied attacks in the blue lines there, two different paths they were taking to Tokyo. So the air war in the Pacific is a marvelous story. We're very glad to have John here tonight to teach us that story. The air war required air production. Here's some raw totals. And even a cursatory look kind of reminds us what we learned last week, that indeed Muskegon is the arsenal of democracy. And the United States won the war through superior production. We look at these numbers of U.S. aircrafts compared to Japanese, fighter planes, bomber planes, and this was evident particularly later in the war, as we had kind of a late start, so to speak, getting on board production-wise. The Pacific was a small war. Despite three million square miles, it was small compared to the European theater. Only 50 aircraft carriers with both sides, 50 cruisers, destroyers, submarines. This is a small number, actually, when you consider the entire breadth of the theater. Only 2.2 million people were, troops were sent to this area compared to 20 times that in the European theater. So in many respects, this is a small aspect of the war. And that was part of the continuing battle throughout the entire war was allocation of assets. We talked about that several weeks, and particularly Dan Weichel brought that up with the Battle of Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima, that there's always this competition for assets. So as vast as the Pacific theater was, in many respects, it was small. Tonight's speaker, Mr. John Stevenson, really does not need much of an introduction of this crowd. Uh, John has been just one of the stalwarts here in Muskegon County, working for a long time with the Chronicle as managing editor. Uh, he likes to fancy himself as a non-historian. I would argue that with him as a Michigan graduate. Yeah, again, one of those. But I think that everyone in one form or another is a historian, and John certainly is a historian, he's a teacher, he's been instrumental in bringing the LST to life there in the harbor, working with our veterans and really helping our entire community. John, we're glad to have you. Please join me in welcoming John Stevenson tonight. Tonight our topic is aerial warfare on a scale of monumental proportions, encompassing tens of thousands of miles over the Earth's largest ocean. And right in the middle of the world's most far-flung air battle during the biggest war in human history was a former halfback from Muskegon, Michigan, who decided to drop his dentistry studies to become a pilot. And what a pilot, Lieutenant J.G. Ira C. Ike Kepford would become. In just three months of desperate combat during World War II, with the best fighters the Japanese could throw at him, he downed 16 warplanes to become the leading Navy ace in the Pacific at the beginning of 1944. But Kepford 
was, like many brave, remarkable pilots on both sides, essentially a test pilot. He was among the first to fly his new type of airplane in combat and to find out if it could give him an advantage in the razor-thin difference between life and death in aerial combat. There were many reasons for success and failure in the aerial battlefields of the Pacific, including tactical decisions, problems of supply, and even cultural factors. At the same time, the advance of aircraft technology in the Pacific Air War mirrored the needs of the strategists as they sought to achieve their war aims. Two examples. The Japanese needed speedy conquest at the beginning of the war, and that led to the development of the Mitsubishi A6M-0 fighter, which could fly long distances and outmaneuver allied pre-war designs. The Americans' determination late in the war to pound the Japanese homeland into submission sped development of the Boeing B-29, which carried awesome bomb loads for thousands of miles, but should have been kept on the testing ramps for another year because of dangerous engines. Tracing these technological developments throughout the war will provide a good overview of the sweeping scope of the Pacific Air War. We'll also get to learn about some pretty cool airplanes. World War II in the Pacific started in China. Japan was actively interfering in that sovereign country as early as 1931, but launched an invasion in 1937. By 1940, the Chinese government was desperately seeking help from anyone. Enter retired American Air Corps officer Claire Chenault and his Flying Tigers. Chenault, an air advisor to the Chinese since 1937, spent months in America recruiting fighter pilots and acquiring planes and crew to take to China. He managed to get a shipload of Curtis P-40B fighters, mostly because the British considered it an obsolete aircraft. He hired military pilots with promises of bounties and high salaries. In summer 1941, they all headed for Rangoon in Burma, now Myanmar. After months of training and assembly, and plenty of accidents, the Flying Tigers were ready to fight. But their first combat would not take place until 12 days after the Pearl Harbor attack. They were credited with destroying 300 Japanese planes, but probably shot up only half that many. Even so, only 16 Tiger pilots were killed or went missing on combat missions, an amazing ratio and a great morale boost at the time. As it turned out, this was an air battle of obsolete aircraft that resulted in development of modern combat tactics thanks to the brilliance and desperation of General Chenault. The Japanese owned the air over China. They were flying monoplane fixed gear fighters like the Nakajima Ki-27, allied codename Nate, and bombers like the Mitsubishi Ki-21 Sally and the Mitsubishi G-4M Betty, a medium bomber used throughout the war. But those were state of the art at the time and had overwhelmed the biplanes of the Chinese Air Force. Over his years as an advisor in China, Chenault had observed that the Japanese built their aircraft to be light and nimble. They could turn on a dime and climb like an elevator, but they had no armor protection and no self-sealing gas tanks. Chenault knew that the heavy P-40 could not maneuver like a Japanese plane, but the Warhawks could not be caught in a dive by the light nates and could outshoot them with their much heavier 50 caliber machine guns. He also knew it would not take much to set fire to an Imperial plane. Chenault ordered his flying tigers to only attack from above the Japanese formations and never get into a turning duel. 
It was a very effective technique from the outset, and Chenault made it a strict rule. Dive. Spray the enemy formation with gunfire, keep diving to provide no chance for revenge, then make a decision on how or whether to hit him again. The Japanese kept making mostly light, nimble planes that burned easily throughout the war. The Americans made bigger, more powerful planes throughout the war. Chenault's tactic worked every time it could be employed. It would help many American fighter pilots, including Ike Ketford, defeat their Japanese counterparts. P-40s would meet a different level of competition in Hawaii and the Philippines in December 1941. Japanese naval aviation was arguably the most advanced in the world at the time. The three main attack planes at Pearl Harbor and Manila were the vaunted Mitsubishi A6M-0 and the multi-role bombers, the Nakajima B-5N Kate and the Aichi D-3A Val. Both bombers flew more than 200 miles an hour. One of the American Navy's counterparts, the Douglas Devastator, could only top 130 miles an hour with a tailwind. The few American fighters who got aloft during those days of infamy found out what a formidable dogfighter the Zero could be. Knowing nothing of Chenault's tactics, pilots of the Warhawks, Grumman F4F Wildcats, and the ancient Buffalo, Brewster Buffaloes, learned hard and often fatal lessons. In the months following Pearl Harbor, America and her allies reeled as Japan marched victoriously across the Pacific. Imperial forces could only do so because of complete mastery of the air and sea, provided for the most part by her powerful navy. As she expanded her empire south and west, she created island fortresses from which to defend her new borders and build airstrips for Army and Navy aircraft to defend those strongholds. Japan already had a number of strong points, particularly Truk Island south of Guam, which had been ceded to the Empire after World War I. It was considered the Gibraltar of the Pacific and was the naval base used in the Japanese conquest of the Solomon Islands and the attacks on New Guinea, the huge island just north of Australia. From Truk, the Japanese created another important base, Rabaul, on the large island near New Guinea. The Battle of Fortress Rabaul became the longest continuous aerial fight of the Pacific War. The Japanese captured the base in January 1942, built it into a massive airfield and shipping complex, and opposed American aerial assaults that included Ike Kepford, until nearly 100,000 Japanese combatants surrendered there in September 1945. While American and Allied soldiers were retreating everywhere in early 1942, the air war in New Guinea was well underway. American and Australian bombers and fighters were attacking Uh, Japanese airfields and shipping, as well as trying to provide air support for the defenders of New Guinea. It was a desperate hour for Australia. New Guinea's loss would double the difficulty of retaking the Southwest Pacific and might even imperil the land down under itself. This is a good point to explain the nature of aerial campaigning in the Pacific and combat against the Japanese. Missions routinely stretched a thousand miles or more to the limits of an airplane's range, and every mile flown was over trackless ocean or equatorial jungle. From 1942 to 1945, hundreds of airplanes took off from bases or carriers and simply disappeared. No distress call, no crash site, nothing. Some flyers were captured by the Japanese, but that was like a death sentence more than 45% of the empire's captives died. Japanese aviation and treatment of prisoners was affected by a philosophical attitude towards warfare. Bushido, a way of the warrior, dominated Japanese cultural beliefs and training. The literature classic Hagakuri says, Bushido is a way of dying. 
do not live in shame as a prisoner. Now that manifested itself in a number of ways. It was official policy that aircraft were for attack. Defensive measures like armor to protect the pilot or self-sealing fuel tanks would only make the plane slower and impede aggressive tactics. Also, parachutes were allowed for air crew, but they were optional. In the first few years of the war, many flyers declined to wear them. If your aircraft was damaged, a suicide dive called Tayatari, literally body crashing, was much more honorable. This obviously caused attrition among frontline pilots. In this picture, the gunner is standing up in this airplane. He then sat down and crashed into the ocean with his plane. In the early stages, Allied pilots flew what they had on hand to battle the Zeros and the Japanese Army's Nakajima Ki-43 Oscars. They had P-40s and uh, Bell P-39 air crowbers, an odd little American fighter with the engine behind the pilot and a big cannon in front of him. Uh, later versions of the plane, equipped with uh, engine superchargers and better armament, were competitive with the Zeros and Oscars, but in 1942, the early versions took heavy losses. There were fast but crash-prone uh, Martin B-26 Marauders, some early model Boeing B-17s, and a medium bomber that was to become one of the most adaptable and useful airplanes of the war, the North American B-25 Mitchell. The B-25 was designed and first built at the end of the 1930s and was a proven aircraft by the time war came to America. There were small numbers of Mitchells in Australia in early 1942 in time to join the 26s and 17s to attack, well, really to harass uh, the Japanese airdromes on the north shore of New Guinea and even take a swing at Fortress Rabaul. Of course, the most famous B-25 mission in history came on April 18, 1942, when Colonel Jimmy Doolittle led 16 Army bombers off the Navy carrier USS Hornet to attack Tokyo, a courageous act unparalleled in military aviation history. It's not well known that B-25s and B-26s bombed Japanese airfields around Rabaul 12 days earlier. America's Navy was also trying to get its licks in using the only weapons it had left, aviation. Fast task forces were created around the big carriers with the aim of striking the Japanese with hit and run tactics. The admirals would have to pick their fights, but one was forced upon them in early May, May, uh, early May 1942. It was learned through code breakers that a Japanese invasion force was headed for the south shore of New Guinea. And it had to be stopped. The US carriers Lexington and Yorktown traded blows with Japanese carriers over two days in the Battle of the Coral Sea, in history's first sea battle in which combatant ships never sighted or fired on each other. Battle losses were more severe for the U.S. Each side had a big carrier badly damaged, but the Americans lost Enterprise while the Japanese lost only a small carrier. But the Japanese invasion fleet turned around, making it an important strategic victory for the Allies. At this point, the Japanese naval strategists, led by the brilliant Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, believed they had the American fleet on the ropes. Their correct analysis was that the U.S. Pacific fleet was as weak as it could get. Soon the arsenal of democracy would start sending dozens of new carriers and battleships to sea. They believed they should draw the Americans into battle and wipe them out. If what's left of their fleet is destroyed, they will have to sue for peace. At the same time, Japan's war leaders believed the Imperial Navy was at the height of its power. 
Its ships, crews, planes, and flyers were battle-tested and better than anything the enemy could field. Imperial forces were undefeated at sea, on land, and in the air. All they needed to do was to get the Americans into battle, and they'd win. That's what the Japanese believed. Really, they weren't far wrong. And that's why the overwhelming American victory in the June 1942 Battle of Midway has been called a miracle. The battle started as expected. The powerful Japanese carrier fleet blasted Midway Island's defenses. The island's meager air contingent responded and was shot out of the sky or damaged beyond repair. The Imperial fleet prepared for a finishing strike on the island to be followed by the expected successful invasion force. Imperial search planes were out looking for the American carriers but hadn't found them. Then came some of the miracles of Midway. They started a few days before. Code, American codebreakers discovered the target and course of Yamamoto's invasion force, making it easy to lay a trap. And the carrier Yorktown, needing two weeks of repairs after being blasted at Coral Sea, returned to duty after only 48 hours thanks to incredible work by American repair crews. In those days before good radar, the Japanese carriers couldn't be found until a consolidated PBY Catalina search plane, one of the war's great workhorses, broke through thick rain clouds and spotted the whole fleet. The sighting prompted American carriers to launch an all-out attack. The Japanese destroyer Arashi was part of the carrier fleet and stopped to drop death charges on the U.S. Nautilus. After a couple of hours, she left at flank speed to catch up with the main fleet. Her long white wake was seen by the American dive bombers who had flown to the original sighting location. A Japanese scout plane, the last to take off because of engine problems, finally found the American carriers. Hearing the scouts report, the Japanese commander ordered the land bombs taken off his planes and torpedoes put on, delaying the next strike by an hour and keeping his carriers filled with armed, gassed planes. American torpedo planes were the first to find the Japanese carriers. They launched a somewhat uncoordinated attack, each group boring in as it found the enemy fleet. The Douglas Devastators were slow, easy targets for the patrolling Japanese Zeros, who dove down and destroyed the Americans with ease. Very few made it back. Only one man survived from this squadron, the USS Hornet's Torpedo 8. Their sacrifice brought ultimate victory. The Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bombers who followed the destroyer to the Japanese fleet attacked without interference because the Zeros were down below. They dove almost straight down from 14,000 feet and dropped 1,000-pound bombs on the crowded decks of three of the four carriers in the task force. The destruction was immediate and complete. Three Japanese carriers were left flaming hulks. It was certainly the most important six minutes of the Pacific War. Two more carriers were sunk during the battle, one American and one Japanese, and some other ships went down. But Japan's loss of more than 3,000 trained aircrew and carrier aviation specialists, combined with the losses at Coral Sea the month before, were devastating blows to the Japanese naval aviation. The bodies could be replaced, but not the battle-hardened skills and experience. Before Midway, the Japanese never lost. After Midway, they never won. The destruction of Yamamoto's air power at Midway meant that island and Hawaii were safe. It allowed the Americans to invade Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands and begin the long island hopping 
campaign that would reduce Japan's far-flung empire and lead eventually to attacks on the home island. The August 1942 campaign still meant fighting with pre-war aircraft designs. Navy and Marine pilots were flying Grumman F4F Wildcats, stubby-looking fighters that were slower and less maneuverable than their Japanese opponents. But the ruggedly built Wildcats were well-armed and could take a lot of punishment. Fighter wing leaders like Lieutenant Commander John Thatch, creator of the Thatch Weave defensive tactic, and Marine Major Joe Foss, who scored 26 kills flying a Wildcat, showed that leadership and tactics could overcome the plane's shortcomings. The next generation of fighters and bombers was on the way. By the fall of 1942, Japanese pilots were being surprised and shot down by the new Lockheed P-38 Lightning. The twin-boom, twin-engine fighter was certainly a radical design, but it was uniquely suited for the Pacific Air War. It had tremendous range and could also get home on one engine. It, that made a big difference when missions involved flights hundreds of miles long over endless ocean. The Grumman TBF-TBM Avenger took over torpedo bomber duties from the outclassed Devastator and served admirably the rest of the war. It was the largest single-engine plane of World War II, very easy to fly, was faster and had more range than the Japanese Kate, which was never replaced, and could carry a ton of ordnance. The Dauntless was supplanted in Navy squadrons by the huge Curtis SB-2C Helldiver, which was much faster and could carry more bombs. But the pilot called the SB-2C son of a bitch second class <laughs> because, it was, because of its unwieldy carry, carrier landing and takeoff characteristics. Marines kept their Dauntlesses to the end of the war. The consolidated B-24 Liberator became the staple of heavy bombardment groups in the Pacific as 1942 turned to 43. The more famous B-17 was favored by flyers because of its rugged qualities and ease of handling, but the B-24 could fly faster, farther, and carry a bigger payload. Those qualities were highly prized in the thousand-mile missions over the Pacific. What airmen didn't like was the Liberators usually broke in two when dish, ditching in the ocean and sank like two stones. Two aircraft, one American and one Japanese, were very successfully adapted to meet their commander's desperate needs in early 1943. But their stories also provide clear examples for how the fortunes of war went in opposite directions for the Empire and the US. American and Australian air campaigners were trying their best to stop Japanese shipping from supplying and reinforcing their expeditions in New Guinea. But it's hard to hit ships dropping bombs from high altitude. So a clever colonel named Paul Gunn tried arming B-25s with up to eight 50 caliber machine guns in the nose fired by the pilot. The medium bombers would come right down to wave height blast the ships with machine gun fire, and then drop a 500-pound bomb as they went over. The effect on a lightly armored warship or merchant ship was devastating. A four-second burst would result in roughly 1,000 pinky-sized bullets striking the ship, followed by a tremendous bomb blast. The first real test of this dangerous tactic was a March 1943 attack on a convoy of eight Japanese troop transports and escorts heading for New Guinea. The newly adapted B-25 strafers left all the transports sinking or burning and killed half the enemy soldiers. The Battle of the Bismarck Sea was an overwhelming U.S. victory and would ensure the future development of the commerce destroyers that would help strangle Japan's war economy. At the same time, the Japanese were finding themselves unable to defend Fortress Rabaul at night. Their air patrols had made it too dangerous for the unescorted B-24s and B-17s from New Guinea to attack in daylight, but night bombing was effective and annoying, and the Japanese had no night fighters. A hot-headed air officer who had served in New Guinea, Commander Yasuno Kazono, 
believed a new twin-engine reconnaissance plane, the Nakajima N1, J, uh, J1 N1 Irving, could be adapted with both downward and upward firing cannons to make an effective night fighter. His idea was met with scorn, but he persevered and was allowed to develop two of the planes. With limited testing and one crash, the renamed Gecko, which means moonlight, took to the air during a B-17 night raid in April 1943. On its very first mission, it shot down two American Boeings. It was months and many lost bombers before American commanders realized they had a night fighter problem. But by then, they had a growing daylight uh, fighter and bomber supremacy. At the same time, the Japanese did little to develop the gecko, and amazingly, the Germans, their allies, developed an identical upward-firing night fighter independently. They never talked. The Japanese would need an improved Nighthawk against the B-29s in 1945. The JN, J1N1 could not catch a B-29, but short-sighted leadership would cost Japan yet again. The American island hopping drive progressed through 1943, taking New Georgia and bringing Japan's main forward base, Rabaul, into easy fighter range for the first time. Marine and Navy land-based squadrons were assigned to forward airstrips cut from jungles with names like Vela La Vela and Andongo. They flew the new Chance Vought F4U-1 Corsair, a huge fighter designed around a bomber engine and propeller that required towering landing gear and gull wings so that the propeller would not hit the deck. Considered by some unsuitable for carrier operations, that was later disproved, it was assigned to squadrons on land. The plane was ungainly on the ground and a little bit hard to land because of visibility problems, but incredibly fast and highly maneuverable in the air. The Corsair was a sweet flying baby if ever I flew one, said Gregory Pappy Boyington, a famous Corsair ace who commanded the Marine Black Sheep Squadron. It took a special kind of pilot to fly these new-to-battle Corsairs, and Ike Kepford was special, sometimes just a little too special for the brass hats. Ike son of George and Emma Kepford, 191 West Forest, was a star halfback for the Muskegon Big Reds and then a tough blocking back for Northwestern University in 1941 while studying dentistry. In 1942, he earned his Navy wings and was assigned to VF-17, a new fighter squadron training in Norfolk, Virginia, and selected to fly a brand new aircraft, the F-4U-1. Belying his stuffy dentistry background, Ike became one of the hellions of the squadron. He was confined to barracks for 10 days for a mock dogfight against a North American P-51 Mustang over the city of Norfolk. <laughs> Legend has it, he won. His squadron, led by Lieutenant Commander Tom Blackburn, adopted the Jolly Roger flag on the cowling as a symbol before it was sent to New Georgia in late 1943. Flying from Andongo, translation, the place of death, Blackburn's irregulars racked up an amazing score against a still potent Japanese fighter force flying from well-supplied Fortress Rabaul. They flew 8,577 combat hours, destroyed 156 planes and five ships for a loss of 12 pilots. The squadron had 12 aces, more than any other naval unit, and their legend lives on. There is still a Jolly Rogers squadron in the United States Navy, VF-103. Ike Kepford, from Muskegon, Michigan, was their ace of aces. 
Ike made his name for bravery and good shooting right off the bat, not two weeks after they arrived in Andongo. VF-17 was assigned to defend carriers while the fleet's aircraft attacked Rabaul in what became known as the Battle of the Solomon Sea. The Japanese counterattacked, and Ike, flying his famous Hog 29, went after a torpedo bomber attacking a carrier, bravely following the enemy right into the teeth of the carrier's anti-aircraft fire. He downed the bomber and turned away, spotting another flight of dive bombers. He chased them down and destroyed three of them, firing until his guns and fuel tanks were empty. He radioed for permission to land and just made it onto the deck of the carrier he'd just saved. As his plane was refueled and rearmed, the carrier's captain came off the bridge and personally served him a cup of coffee. He was awarded the Navy Cross for his actions. He actually had two separate battles with four confirmed kills, each one a remarkable feat, but two in one career is just amazing. On January 29, 1944, he and his wingman were flying top cover for a strike force. A dozen zeros flew in below him to attack. In a series of dives, firing passes, and recoveries, those are textbook Chennault tactics, he shot down four enemy planes. His armorer, back at the base, discovered he had expended just 75 bullets per gun. Pretty good shooting. His, most, his other most memorable escapade involved a narrow escape and, of course, two victories. Ike was on a fighter, a fighter sweep when he was sent back to base after his wingman developed an engine problem. On his way, he spotted a lone zero float plane and took a short detour to send him down in flames. Before he could turn for home, he saw a large flight of Japanese planes high above. He stayed down at wave height but was spotted and four zeros came after him. As they dove, he extended his flaps and gear so the leader would overshoot. Then Ike lifted his nose and shot the zero's tail off. The other three had him bracketed, so all he could do was pull up his gear, his flaps, throttle forward, and try to outrun him. But he was headed for Rabal, not for home. He inched ahead and then used a unique Corsair engine feature called water injection to gain a burst of speed, but that only works for a minute. He got out of firing range and decided to gamble on a left turn towards home. He turned and so did the zero on his left. But as he did, the enemy plane's wingtip caught a wave and he cartwheeled into the sea. Ike made it home on fumes, his flight suit wringing wet from the nerve-wracking four-hour mission. He talked about his missions as a fighter pilot with a Muskegon Chronicle reporter in 1985. It's a dangerous business. You know that in the back of your mind, but you don't let it come forward. When the adrenaline is pumping, it's really exciting, but eventually it becomes a day's work. You don't get tired of flying, but there's a hidden stress. It's a subconscious thing you carry. We'd sit around after a mission and talk about our airplanes as our coffins. But the next morning, you didn't think about it. By the end of February 1944, Ike had 16 kills, making him the top-scoring Navy ace at that time. He'd, sit on, he'd stay on top until June 1944 and would end the war eighth on the U.S. Navy's list of aces. He'd remain its top Corsair ace of all time. He was sent back to the States and was assigned to the Fleet Air Command Staff with one short squadron tour for the rest of the war. Ike Kepford earned two Navy crosses, the Silver Star, multiple Distinguished Flying Crosses, and numerous other commendations. All-American football star, war hero, and then business leader. 
He became president of Liggett Rexall Drugs and was principal in some other businesses until retiring to Harbor Springs in northern Michigan with his wife, Craig, and children, Tim and Tracy. Ike Kepford passed away in 1987. Not surprisingly, he was extraordinarily famous in West Michigan during the war years and the last years of the war, and his mother was regularly visited by reporters. She would always say, you know, I have two boys overseas. Harry Kepford served with the 33rd Infantry Division in the Philippines in the last year of the war and received both the Silver Star and the Distinguished Service Cross. Both are for bravery under fire and the DSC is often given to soldiers who could just as easily have been given the Medal of Honor. Whether in football or combat, I would not have wanted to be on the other side of the line from those Kepford boys. Shortly after Ike rotated back to the United States, the Japanese high command decided to cut their losses in the air over Rabaul. The Jolly Rogers, the Black Sheep, and dozens of other squadrons had decimated Imperial air power. Between November 1943 and March 1944, the Japanese lost 359 aircraft, while Allied losses totaled 136. Fortress Rabaul's day was done. As Japan's empire shrank, aircraft development focused more on newer models of old designs, including changes in engine power and armament. The top Japanese aircraft factories did come out with some impressive new designs in late 1943, codenamed George, Jack, Tony, and Frank. Sounds like Sinatra's Rat Pack. <laughs> American fighter pilots were impressed with flashes of performance from some of them. The Kawasaki Tony had an inline engine like a P-51 Mustang and similar characteristics. The Nakajima Frank was a fearsome high-altitude bomber interceptor. It was true that Imperial airplane development and production did not keep pace with the American industrial juggernaut, and that U.S. submarine campaign effectively strangled Japan's fuel supply. But the Japanese would not change their fight-to-the-death philosophy which ran deep in the Japanese culture and even deeper in military training. As the war progressed, it developed into the biggest technological problem Japanese aviation faced. What was really lacking by the last years of the war was trained pilots. Gone were the crack fighter pilots with dozens of kills in China and New Guinea and bomber pilots with many successful missions against islands and ships. Attrition was turning Japan's proud military air fleets into a glorified flying school. And the imperial warlords spouting the Bushido doctrine of glor glorious death played a major role in the ultimate defeat of their air forces. This was never so obvious as in the June 1944 Battle of the Philippine Sea, the last of the great carrier versus carrier battles of World War II. It was better known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot because American pilots in their dominant Grumman Hellcat F6F fighters massacred the barely trained Japanese flyers. More than 600 aircraft were destroyed and three fleet carriers lost. The Americans lost 120 planes and saved half those pilots. The Japanese were realizing they did not have the Navy, they did not have the Air Force, they did not have the Army to defeat the enemy. But they had discovered fighting to the death made the Americans bleed terribly. At Iwo Jima, the Japanese had suffered 22,000 casualties and the Americans 26,000. Of course, almost all the Japanese casualties were deaths and 7,000 Americans died. And while their student pilots could not compete with American Hellcats and Corsairs, 
Some could get past and crash into American ships, and they didn't even have to teach these kamikaze pilots how to land. During the last year of the war, nearly 4,000 kamikaze pilots were sacrificed. In all, 47 Allied vessels were sunk by kamikaze attacks and 300 were damaged. The suicide bombers were a terribly effective weapon. They killed about 4,900 sailors and wounded about 4,800. Nearly 14% of the attacks managed to hit a ship. This teen pilot helped kill 348 sailors aboard the USS Bunker Hill. The final phase of the war involved bringing the fight to the Japanese homeland. No B-17 or B-24 could get within reach of Tokyo. It would only be possible with an amazing new plane being built by Boeing. The B-29 Super Fortress was super indeed compared to other bombers. It could go almost 100 miles an hour faster, 1,000 miles farther, and carry 10 tons of bombs. One little problem, its engines kept catching on fire. During 1943 and 1944, Boeing was making so many fixes on, to the planes that they were being flown directly from the factory line to the modification center. They didn't get the first one to combat until spring 1944, and then they got it to the wrong place. It was originally hoped that the bomber bases could be built in China so that a campaign could be launched from there. But the Japanese controlled most of China's coastal area, so the bombers based in central China uh, near Chengdu would have to be supplied from India. In fact, they pretty much had to fly their own bombs and fuel to the base. They tried for a few months with little success, but made some important discoveries and advancements. Navigators and bombardiers made the first discoveries of the jet stream. The narrow bands of mighty winds between polar and warmer regions that can blow 450 miles an hour at certain altitudes. They blow right over Japan, and the super fortresses flew high enough to be buffeted by them and to have their bombs scattered by them. They also got a new commanding general, Curtis LeMay, the youngest general officer in the Air Force when he was promoted and soon to prove to be the most aggressive. LeMay could see China was not going to work out. He moved up the schedule to relocate most of the B-29 effort to the Marianas Islands, Tinian, Guam, Saipan, which had been secured by the Marines in summer 1944. The islands were closer to Japan than the China bases, had long airstrips, and could easily be supplied by ship. This final bombing campaign of the Pacific got underway in earnest in November 1944, but was plagued by the same problems. Engine fires, battles with the jet stream, poor bombing results. The B-29s were tough to keep running, a challenge to fly, and easy to crash. But a lot of bombs were falling on Japan. They just weren't falling where LeMay wanted them. The high altitude capabilities of the B-29, the jet stream winds, and the relatively cloudy conditions over Japan reduced bombing accuracy. The American intelligence, American intelligence also knew Japanese industry was not centralized in factory districts like the U.S., but was spread throughout neighborhoods. In fact, much military-related piecework was done cottage industry style in people's homes. In a plan so innovative, dangerous, and horrifying that LeMay himself said he could have been charged as a war criminal if the U.S. had lost the war, the B-29 commander filled 279 super fortresses with incendiary bombs aimed at starting fires in the Japanese wooden homes, brought the high-flying planes down to 5,000 feet, 
and launched them at Tokyo on March 9, 1945. He lost just 5% of his attacking planes. The Japanese lost 100,000 dead and 16 square miles of their capital city in a firestorm. It was terribly successful, and LeMay repeated it many times in Tokyo and other cities over the next six months. The devastation wrought by the B-29s in Japan was unimaginable. They were joined in the last months by vast U.S. Navy fleets sitting offshore launching raids of carrier planes each day at selected targets. By the end of the war, 40% of Tokyo, a city nearly as large as New York City, had been destroyed. The Japanese were able to put up only token resistance. The B-29s and the combined arms of the United States were bringing Japan's economy to its knees. But there was no hint of capitulation from the imperial warlords, and everything the Americans had learned about the Japanese at war indicated they would not surrender, they would have to be defeated. The U.S. High Command had one more weapon to unleash on the empire that might have the shock value needed to bring the Japanese to their senses. The B-29s were the delivery system. Colonel Paul Tibbetts' squadron of specially manufactured silver plate B-29s was assigned to drop America's two atomic bombs on Japan. He took the first one, called Little Boy, himself in a B-29 named after his mother, Enola Gay, and dropped it August 6th, 1945, on Hiroshima, the largest city in Japan that hadn't been firebombed. More than 75,000 people died at the dawn of the nuclear age. The Japanese leaders did not respond, possibly because they could not comprehend what had happened in Hiroshima. So America's only other A-bomb, Fat Man, was dropped on Nagasaki on August 9th. Emperor Hirohito then informed the Imperial Council it was time to end the war. While atomic bombs are terrible killers, in this case, they probably saved more lives than any other weapon in history. The United States was prepared to invade Japan, an assault whose plans were already underway and included our own LST-393, which was on its way to the Panama Canal when the bombs dropped. That invasion would have cost tens of thousands of American lives and millions of Japanese lives. Thank goodness those bombs worked. Did America win the air war in the Pacific because of superior technological advances? Yes. And also because of the bravery and selfless devotion of Ike Kepford and hundreds of thousands of young Americans like him. Thank you. The credit for this PowerPoint presentation goes to my son, James Stevenson. <laughs> Reese Puffer, class of 97, who is now a video engineer in New York City. John, for someone who maybe has not been to the museum, what are some of the exhibits we would find at the LST? The LST is a veterans museum and uh, honors uh, 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 veterans of all wars and we have displays of uh, um, local veterans, uh, Vietnam veterans. Uh, we also honor um, uh, all services, uh, air power, Navy, Army, Marines, uh, women in the military. Uh, we have a, a vast display of uniforms. And uh, it's also, we've restored many of the compartments to be the way it was 
1944, and of course LST-393 was at uh, Omaha Beach on D-Day, actually D-Night. Um, and this is the 70th anniversary of D-Day. So a nice place to visit to remember that. Thank you very much. We look at a legacy of war, particularly in the Pacific, but everywhere. Looking back at the events of World War II through our 21st century lens, it's easy to lose sight of what war really was. When we study war in the history books, most people assume that the war was played out in a series of dramatic battles where the Allied forces used overwhelming firepower to capitulate the enemy and ultimately defeat. But I think we all know that the fog of war is somewhat different. When the soldiers of World War II were just teenagers, they marched proudly across parade grounds at bases all over this country. They hitchhiked from base to home and spent their weekends with their buddies dreaming of life after the service. They lived in tent cities and breathed the dust of camps in faraway places. They chased girls, lived fast, well, as fast as they could, and wrote letters home to their folks. As they lived their lives in wartime, combat veterans faced a hard reality every single day. No matter where they were, young men and women faced the idea of knowing not long how long they had to live. But they should have been home fixing cars, going to ball games, taking their sweethearts to the prom. Instead, they learned to hike, to shoot, and to maneuver. And at each stop, they would soon shove off for the next camp, the next staging area, the next beachhead. There really was no rotation plan. There were only two ways home, the end of the war or an incapacitating wound. Many Americans enlisted. Others received their draft notice. Nearly all of them formed their ideas of life in the military from Hollywood. This fantasy of combat showed men dying quickly and gallantly with wounds that seemed to cause no suffering. This Hollywood version of war failed to show the true combat horrors. But in the final tally, the U.S. Vict was victorious not because of its weapons, but because of its people. Every last battle seemed to balance on a razor's edge between victory and defeat. Everyone in this country is affected in ways large and small by the experience of war. When the war was over, this greatest generation moved on with their lives. They raised families, went home to work, tried to find their piece of the American dream. Their medals were put away in boxes, and their stories of war friendships were reserved for BFW halls. Today we celebrate and honor our veterans through educational programs like this. And I would like to take a minute to ask every veteran from every era here tonight to please stand and let's honor them with our applause and our thanks. Thank you all. Our next speaker, Mr. Don Goodman, truly a diamond in the rough. <laughs> As is the book that he wrote about the history of Muskegon Community College entitled Diamond in the Rough. I met with one of his former colleagues this morning, Mr. Bill Garrigan, and Bill reminded me of many things of Don Goodman's legacy at Muskegon Community College. He wasn't really a professor in the writing department. He wasn't really a professor in the reading department. But he did pioneer what we call the PAL lab, the Personal Achievement Laboratory, which combines the, the uh, skills of writing and reading, which are really the very baseline, fundamental aspect of college. And that's a program that has served thousands and thousands of students that was started by Don Goodman during his time there. 
spoke with Professor Dan Yakes, and he said to make sure I do not refer to Don as an old curmudgeon. And I guess that was one curmudgeon from another. Dr. Frank Marzak reminded me of the tremendous negotiation skills as Frank as management and in the administration and Don on the other side representing our faculty for many years and how he was just his particular attention detail. So in many respects, Don has left a tremendous legacy at the school. We have two professor at Emeritus, which are our highest honor for our retired professors, and there's only two of them, and one of them is our next speaker. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Don Goodman. Thank you. Uh, Bill had many kind words for you this morning. There were none of them true, but... <laughs> I'm going to talk about a book tonight, but it's not The Diamond in the Rough. I'll tell you a little bit more about this, the new version of this, uh, when we get to it. One of my favorite uh, authors is Jim Harrison. Jim is a Michigan uh, writer. He's an essayist. He's a novelist. He's mostly a poet. And one of his poems ends with this. Death steals everything except our stories. Dick Herring, his name is spelled H-A-R-I-N-G, dropped in to visit MJC in February 1942. Herring had graduated from the college in 1939 and gone on to Western State, which was later called Western Michigan University, where he joined the CPT, that was a civilian pilot training program, and he graduated from that in 1941. He then enlisted in the Marine Corps. And he learned to fly fighters, probably the Brewster Buffalo and the F4F Wildcat. He'd worked, <clears throat> he was never spectacular, according to the president of the college. Uh, he was steady and sound. In fact, he spent four years in the two-year college and I, I found his student record, he racked up a spectacular number of Ds for you students. <laughs> he subsequently turned most of them into Cs. <clears throat> he never flunked a course. His official photo shows a long, narrow face and high forehead, a casual, almost shy smile. In February 1942, he... Uh, <clears throat> He, uh, in his February 1942, in, in sharp marine dress uniform, he told of having seen in Miami the premiere of the movie Song of the Islands, starring Betty Grable. Grable was a pinup of the armed forces, her fetching bathing suit photo push pinned or taped on locker doors and bulletin boards and barrack walls all over the world. Uh, it was estimated that two million servicemen uh, ended up with a still shot of her in her white bathing suit looking over her shoulder. She was the girl with the million dollar legs whose musicals made her the highest paid woman in America. Herring was chosen to escort her to the cadet dance after the premiere of the movie. When he left the college this time, he left quite an impression. On a side note, in 1940, when Muskegon Junior College students were wobbling into the air over Mona, Lor Mona Lakes, uh, Sinclair's Piper Cub, that is Cindy Sinclair, uh, taught flying right here in Muskegon in his own Piper Cub. It was part of a government program. At that time, a somber 17-year-old baby-faced student named Tayayoshi Koga enlisted in the Tsuchire Navy Flight Training Corps uh, just outside Tokyo. He completed pre-flight training easily and entered basic flight training in, class, in a class of 260. Only 25 of his group made uh, fighter pilot. At 19, in June 1942, Tadayoshi made one miscalculation when landing his zero fighter on a lonely Aleutian island. He flipped his plane and broke his neck. If he'd done this two or three months earlier, he might have saved Dick Herring's life. 
the craft. Uh, this is J uh, John already covered a lot of this. Uh, the they had the Japanese had this incredible bomber, a Betty bomber, which could uh, fly as far as an American B-17. They also had the best carrier-based fighter plane in the world. Their slick, nimble Zero fighter could outfly, outturn, outdistance, and outperform anything the U.S. could throw in the sky. It was easy to see, reported an American test pilot, Corky Meyer, after he'd flown one. Why the, he, it was easy to see why the Zero had gained such a fabulous reputation. And uh, in fact, pilots, American pilots were told, don't dogfight a Zero. <clears throat> The U.S. warplanes, uh, John was kinder to them than I'm going to be. In uh, July 1942, Lieutenant Herring wrote to his parents about the merits of the Zero against the American fighter planes. He said that not many people in the U.S. knew the true situation of air combat in the Pacific. Washington had assured the country that it was supplying U.S. armed forces with superior weapons, and he said, not so. So the planes that we are getting are not the best. The best ones haven't come off of the uh, <clears throat> assembly lines. In 1941, in the Pacific area, and I skipped the P-40 in this, but, uh, the Navy and Marines had three fighter planes. They ranged from inadequate, too pathetic, too staggeringly defective. Two of them, the Buffalo and the Era Cobra later made the world's worst aircraft list, which was a book that came out after the war. The best of the bunch by far was the F4F Grumman Wildcat. It was chunky, clip wing, knock kneed, and bow legged on the ground, but, <clears throat> and it was obsolete in many ways. For instance, in taking off or landing, these early ones, the pilot had to hand crank the landing gear 28 turns to get the wheels up or down. <clears throat> And although the F-4F could not ordinarily dogfight the Zero and outmaneuver it, it could strike quickly by surprise from above. It could take a lot of punishment and maybe escape. The second plane was the P-39 Air Cobra. This was the slickest looking plane on the runway resembling a rocket. It fired a cannon out of its nose. That was good, but that was it. The rest of the airplane was pathetic. Constructed as congressional pork against good advice, uh, the plane hardly qualified as a moving target. Senator Harry S. Truman had even declared it unfit to fly. The P-39s on Guadalcanal were even worse. Besides the fact that they didn't have such fundamentals as tachometers, fuel gauges, or temperature gauges, they had no usable oxygen equipment. Uh, they were pretty good for shooting up landing barges. The last and the worst of the Marine and Navy fighters was a Brewster Buffalo, a blunt, clumsy, wallowy tub of a fighter, overweight and underpowered. The U.S. Navy sent 19 up at the Battle of Midway, and it took the Japanese 20 minutes to shoot 17 of the 19 down. The next year, the U.S. Navy walked into the plant and shut it down. And back to Koga. Tadayoshi Koga, returning from a bombing, strafing run on Dutch Harbor, Alaska, and streaming oil from a single bullet puncture, tried to land wheels down on a muskeg he mistook for a meadow on Akutan Island. His wheels caught, he flipped the plane upside down, and that's where it landed. The Navy found it in excellent condition, put it on a boat, shipped it to California, and flew it. They learned three things about the Mitsubishi Zero. One, it could perform its astonishing acrobatics only at fairly slow speeds, about 200 miles an hour or slower. Two, in a pushover dive, straight down, the carburetor cut out. The plane could not dive vertically. Three, for some oddball reason, the Zero rolled quickly to the left coming out of a dive. But turning to the right, it was a real slug. Word went out to all the Wildcat pilots, zero on your tail, push over into a vertical dive, building up speeds of 300, 400, whatever you could reach, then pull out to the right. Maybe you'd make it. 
On September 13th, a flight of 26 Bettys and a dozen Zeros came in to attack the American-held airfield on Guadalcanal. Seven Marine and nine Navy F-4F Wildcats took off to stop them. They shot down two Bettys and one Zero, but they lost four Wildcats. The pilots of three of those Wildcats bailed out and made it back. Only one pilot was lost that day, Lieutenant Richard Herring. He was shot down in September. The word about Kogo Zero got out in October. A small <clears throat> mid-American co junior college is not the source of generals. Back in the year 2000, Jack Rice and I started, we had finished up the book a diamond in the rough, and we got to talking and thought, you know what, we really ought to turn out a book that focuses on the college in World War II. And so we did. The, the book that was published in 2003 looks like this. Not very many copies were published, and uh, we found out also that librarians and bookstores don't like spiral bindings. Uh, about four years ago, I was talking to Frank Marzak, and he remembered the book. We were talking about the, the book that, that <laughs> was all but unpublished. And he said he was interested in maybe having the submarine republish it in some way if it could be done. Fact is, we couldn't find the original disc. It was on a disc, so we did a lot of scrambling. The new one was supposed to be here tonight. We were supposed to have a book signing and with all the stuff. The copies haven't come. The new copy will look like this on the cover. Uh, it'll be smaller. It'll be a book-sized book, and it'll have traditional binding. As far as the college goes, <clears throat> it's not the source of generals, as I say, although there's no record of the Muskegon Junior College students who served in the armed forces. The 25 students who died represent those who bore the brunt. One major, in fact, he was the first one killed. One major, two captains, 10 lieutenants, one petty officer, one ensign, two sergeants, seven privates, and one flying cadet. For this college, it was primarily an air war. Of the first 10 MJC students killed, eight perished while flying for the US Army, Navy, or Marine Corps. Of the 25 killed in all, 17 died in flight. Two dozen of their names appeared on a plaque found decades later in the back room by a custodian. Jack and I had just started this book about diamond in the rough, and a custodian came in with this huge metal plaque and said, what is this? We found it in a closet, and we looked at it and said, oh, <laughs> this is a list of the 25 students who died in World War II, and we started from that. We started really chasing down the history of World War II and the uh, uh, junior college. <clears throat> The uh, MJC students died in the sands and mud of Corregidor, North Africa, France, the Philippines, Okinawa, Germany, Iwo Jima, and they died someplace in the ocean. They were shot out of the skies over Guadalcanal, Germany, North Sea, Iwo Jima. Training, training and maneuvers were even dangerous. They died in plane crashes in California, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Washington, the Panama Canal Zone, and 18 miles off the coast of Atlantic City, and they flew a bomber into a mountain in Africa. One of the deadlier bodies of water for training, well, one of the deadlier bodies of water for the pilots, claimed 250 American fighters and bombers, and yet not a single Axis plane. It killed 21 American pilots, and not a single German or Japanese or Italian you know the name of the water? Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan. Birthed in Chicago's Navy Pier, two antique coal-fired, side-wheeling steamboats, the Wolverine and Sable, had been furnished with minimal flight decks. 550 feet in length, these abbreviated carriers were designed to train Navy pilots in the fine art and of taking off and landing wildcat fighters and dauntless dive bombers. Belching black smoke across decks too short for safety, 
This pair of ancient mariners steamed out onto Lake Michigan seven days a week, all year long. As soon as the pilot landed, he had to turn around and take off. There was no place to store a plane. These preposterous <clears throat> slapdash twins together carry or qualified 18,000 pilots, each pilot making eight white knuckle landings and eight terrifying takeoffs. One of the qualifying pilots went on to become president of the United States. You know who? Yeah. And although a pilot flying above the lake was never more than 45 miles from land, a few minutes in the winter water could be fatal, and it was. Uh, 21 pilots lost their lives there. <clears throat> the book that was supposed to be here when we all went to war is the story of uh, Muskegon Junior College. It tells of the students who died, the ones who stayed behind and held their college and their nation to a single purpose. It describes how female students seized the opportunities to learn masculine trades like engineering and then went on to earn good wages in defense plants, wiring fighter planes, running lathes. These were students. Um, <clears throat> riveting, welding. It tells of female students joining services, wax waves or nurses, and sometimes being despised for it. Pictures of college trimmed to the bone. It's funny, Paula McClurg, just two weeks ago, sent me a, uh, a, a piece of, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> it was uh, the thing she sent, the uh, religious thing she sent was, uh, any <laughs> yeah, anyway, the religious service for, for uh, uh, students who were graduating. It was held on June 11th, 1944, the, uh, which is five days after D-Day. And it was that, that's what it was. Baccalaureate. A baccalaureate. I couldn't, <laughs> it was a baccalaureate service. Uh, that year, the, Muske the uh, college graduated, only 14 students had been trimmed right down. Do you know how many women there were among the 14? All of them. This was, that was the original. I added a page to the new book. I called it In Honor. Since we first published When We All Went to War some dozen years ago, my friend, colleague, and fellow author Jack W. Rice has passed away. He who helped win the fight with the Axis lost the fight with cancer. Jack was the best lecturer, speaker, and role player I have ever known. He was on stage all his life, and he was proud of it. Six months before he died, he told me his favorite role had been the king in The King and I. You know, Dawn, that was his version of my name, Dawn. You know, Dawn, the king chose when to die. I'll choose when I'm ready. And God said, okay, Jack, okay. <laughs> As I reflect on my own teaching career, I'm amazed and humbled that I was able to work, teach, learn, and write with the very men and women who absolutely saved Western civilization from the most evil people on earth. When we entered World War II, all of Europe except the tiny squiggle of land called England was enslaved, tortured, starved, robbed, and raped by the monsters of Nazi Germany. Almost the entire Pacific Ocean had been conquered by the master criminals who controlled the empire of Japan. Only Australia and the Philippines teetered. My fellow faculty were there at Normandy on D-Day flew combat photo missions and especially equipped P-38 fighter, that was Bill Harrison, fought across Europe and met the Russian army in Germany, that was Gordy Martini, led a U.S. Marine mortar platoon at the base <clears throat> of Mount Sur, and he was there at the base of Mount Suribachi on Iwo Jima while the famous flag was being raised. That was Bruce McRae, who later taught journalism at the college. One of them flew B-29s over Japan. That was Lynn Kingsley, who incidentally was about my size, and I thought of him and that bomber. 
They were among the first Americans to open and discover the horror camps of the Holocaust, and they served in the OSS spy agency, which was a precursor to the CIA, doing God knows what, and I won't tell you her name. And one college member flew P-51 fighters with a Tuskegee Airman. That would be Board of Trustees member Dr. Robert Garrison. And there was Jack Rice, serving as a radio man on a warship, preparing for the invasion of Japan itself. An invasion called off because two atomic bombs ended the war. Jack also told me about his ship depth bombing a stubborn enemy submarine that upon emerging turned into a whale. <laughs> These people taught beside me, next door, down the hall, on the next floor, and in the case of Bob Garrison, sat across the negotiation table from me. Yes, board member Dr. Robert Garrison, who flew combat with the famous Red Tails, represented management at the college while I was a rabid union man. But we were always good friends. We talked fly fishing. My colleagues went about the business of teaching, living quiet, understated lives. They ate cafeteria lemon pie at my table. Gordy Martini was an addict. These were the common, everyday heroes who would have laughed at the word hero, but people who absolutely saved the world we live in from a hell we dare not imagine. There's no way we can honor them. The best we can do is remember their stories. Thank you. Thank you.